host or co-host here. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for being here for the second webinar in our 2021 webinar series hosted by the Ozark chapter of Wild Ones. This webinar is being recorded. So afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. Um, tell you a little bit about our organization. Wild Ones Native Plants Natural Landscapes is a nonprofit organization that promotes environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. If you're interested in joining our chapter or a chapter near you, you can go to the website wildones.org uh, slash membership. Uh, you can join uh, for as low as $25 if you're on limited income or a student. Um, I think the next tier above that would be $40 for a uh, family. Uh, that gets two adults, I believe, and all the children in the home, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, however, we do offer that low income option because we don't want financial limitations to prevent anyone from being able to join the organization to benefit from it. Uh, also, I want to just kind of give a plug for our site committee, which uh, Alyssa is currently chairing. Uh, that they will be able to come out to your home to uh, kind of advise you on which native plant species might be uh, good for your native plant garden. Uh, based on the conditions growing there. So if you're interested in that, don't hesitate to go to our website. We have an online form for our chapter. Um, if you go to ozark.wildones.org, and I believe it's a site committee or site, um, uh, there's a tab up there at the top, and then that'll direct you to a form that you can fill out uh, to request one of these site visits. You can also check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ozark Wild Ones if you want to stay up to date on uh, the things that we have going on, including our uh, you know, different events and other webinars. Uh, you can also reach out to us by email at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. We have a couple of, uh, well, next well, the next two webinars in our series, I want to go ahead and give a plug for. Uh, the next one will be Wednesday, May 5th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, Nate Weston of the Beaver Watershed Alliance will be presenting on riparian management for landowners. So if you uh, have a riparian area, uh, which is the buffer area along a stream or river on your property, then you might be interested in attending that uh, webinar. After that, in June, uh, Wednesday, June 9th, from 1 to 2 p.m., uh, Ryan uh, Denier from Quail Forever will be presenting on Quail Forever in Arkansas, Native Ecosystem Restoration for Thriving Quail Populations. So if you're a landowner, um, and you're interested in knowing how you can help support quail populations in Arkansas, uh, you probably probably want to be, uh, you'd probably be interested in attending that one. Our speaker this month is Lissa Morrison, who's going to speak to us about hosting pollinators throughout the year. Lissa has been in the horticultural industry for 35 years. She has a wide range of experience uh, owning a wholesale plant nursery, a residential landscaping business, and a retail garden center. For eight years, Lissa was, the holder, was on the horticulture staff at the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She was the horticulture supervisor and garden designer for the last four years before retiring for the second time, I believe, in 2018. Currently, Lissa is working with the Arkansas Native Plant Society's Education Committee and is the vice president of the Wild Ones Ozark Chapter organization so that she can continue teaching and promote the use of native plants. So today, uh, Lisa is going to present on hosting pollinators throughout the year. And with that, I will hand it over to Lisa. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. So I'll get right to it. Um, oh, this happened the last time I gave a PowerPoint. It would not move. Eric, do you have any suggestions? I got it's hung up. Um, if we tried maybe hitting the arrow button forward or back. Yes, that's what I usually use and nothing is happening. Let me is it, let me go out and come back in. Okay. I think that worked last time and see if that fixes it um, or start from the beginning and see what happens. Great, that worked. All it was right. an easy fix this time. <laughs> so First of all, let's talk about who the pollinators are. I think most of us, when we think of a pollinator garden or pollinators, we automatically think of butterflies and moths, maybe hummingbirds, but there are many different kinds of pollinators as this slide shows us. There are about 4,000, um, I believe it is, native bees in our region. 
and around 750 native butterflies and thousands of flies that are pollinators and wasps and beetles. And then as you see, there are also some unusual ones or they seem unusual to us like bats and ants. <clears throat> so keep that in mind as we talk about the plants that will support these pollinators. Unfortunately, many, not every single pollinator, but many overall our pollinator numbers are in decline. So um, the whole, I'm gonna give you one little brief pep talk about why it's so important to support the pollinators and create healthy ecosystems that will accomplish that. 75 to 85 percent of all our plants will not flower or make seeds if they are not pollinated by these creatures that I just showed you. Uh, that would affect our food supply and about one third of our food that we eat is dependent on pollinators. So you can see there, just, that's just a little list of all the things. There are so many things that we would be missing if we did not have pollinators. And as I said, pollinators are in decline. So it's really important for us to try to help create healthy ecosystems, even in our urban settings, in our backyards and homes so that we can change this trend of the declining pollinators. Uh, this is a slide that shows you over the last 10 years, uh, this is many of these insects are pollinators on this graph. And uh, according to this uh, statistic, 41%, we have declined 41% in the last 10 years. Now I've read lots and lots of articles on this and I do not want to quibble at all about the numbers and the percentages, but what we do see is that there is a decline, whether it's exactly 41% or not, is what I won't quibble about, but things are declining. So let's help reverse that trend. So I think when we talk about pollinators, this is what pops in most people's mental image. And this is a lovely pollinator garden. Uh, when people first started talking about pollinator gardens, the first time I heard it talked about was maybe 10 years ago. And this is what people think of, I think. And this is lovely, it's productive. I can see that it uh, would be uh, the very kind of thing that many of us would like to have in our yard. This is probably, I'm gonna say around June that you might see this much exquisite beauty all at one time. The rest of the year, this is not there. So what is happening the rest of the year as far as pollinators go? And once this quits blooming, what is supporting the pollinators? So that is what I hope to focus on today is not just what's happening in June, May, June, July, when we see so many flowers blooming. If you drive around town in May, June, and July, there are flowers everywhere. Usually we have not dried up yet and gotten too hot or too dry. Hopefully we won't before say August. But today in this presentation, what I wanna do is focus on how to support the pollinators every single month of the year, particularly early and late. When you go out in the woods and you, or, in, or drive around town, there are not nearly as many flowers in January, February, and March or the end of the year. So I will definitely talk more about that. Uh, I also will only focus on native plants because that's my passion and what I know and talk about. There are other, uh, outside of the native plants, there are some non-natives that support pollinators and there are some annuals, but I will only focus on natives today. This is a limited conversation. Um, and keep in mind that every single slide I show you will have high ecological value. It will be a pollinator supporter or I wouldn't be talking about it. What I would like for us to do or you to do is broaden your thinking in terms of supporting pollinators, not just that lovely slide that I just showed you a few minutes ago, but year round. And so I will also focus on perennials or trees and shrubs that come back every year instead of annuals. Um, and as I go, what I do hope to do is provide cultural tips so that you will be encouraged to use more of these plants that I'm going to show you or to 
broaden your thinking in terms of supporting pollinators so that you can get comfortable with using these more of these plants in your yard. So let's start with January. I will be going, uh, as I show you the slides, they will be chronological in terms of more or less in terms of when they bloom. Uh, every year is different, but let's start with January. And this is, there are two kinds of witch hazels that are prevalent in Arkansas in our region. And this one is, there's one that sort of starts blooming more after Christmas and the one that starts blooming before Christmas in the fall. So this is the one that bl starts blooming in January. This year, Joe Neal, and some of you may know that name from Fayetteville, uh, he's one of our um, uh, specialist in uh, birders in the area. He, he told me he wasn't an expert, but I would like to argue with him about that. He saw this blooming on January 11 of this year. I did too, and uh, but he posted that on Facebook. Uh, what's so that's this is just to show you that even in January, and it blooms quite a while now. This year, the blooms that excuse me, the blooms that were open got slammed by the Arctic blast that happened. And, but then what I noticed is that after that passed, I still had some that began to open up their blooms. So even that Arctic blast did not knock this completely off track. Um, an interesting fact about this particular plant is now vernal, I mean, uh, witch hazels are pollinated by several different insects, but I wanted to show you this particular one up in the right hand corner is called an owlet, as it's spelled O W L E T, an owlet moth. There are a few different kinds of owlet moths. But what's interesting about this moth is that it can be active even when it is, it will be active until it gets to be zero degrees. Now, and the way it does stays alive is it, it's, it, it shivers and that's what keeps it from freezing to death. So I'm only telling you this because I want you to realize that pollinators are active year round whether we see them or not. Of course, nobody's out there looking, well, only entomologists are outside looking for insects when it's two degrees or five degrees. This is just to let you know that year round pollinator activity is happening. And so that's why we need to support the pollinators and, and broaden our thinking past May, June, and July. So this is usually found in the lower, uh, in the valleys around creeks. So it would need medium moisture. What I want to point out with this slide is that it, this one has been shaped and pruned and all native plants can be shaped and pruned. And the same principles apply. So even if it looks wild and rangy out in the wild, you can buy a plant and have it look more like a, you think of with traditional landscaping. So there is a whole group that blooms February, March uh, called spring ephemerals. The thing to know, and there are so many that I'm only gonna show you a few slides of those. Um, in general, the where, where you see the spring ephemerals is in um, uh, deciduous woods. So that would mean uh, uh, in the woods where you see oak trees and hickories, but there's no leaves yet. So these would be blooming in shadier spaces. So that, what that means is that if you wanted to bring a spring ephemerals into your yard, uh, you could put these in flower beds. They like slightly richer soil. They have to have a little bit of humus in the woods for them. You will find them on the north slopes and not the south slopes. The southern slopes are usually drier with shallower soil. The north slopes have uh, humus and they're a little more moist. So uh, almost all of the spring ephemerals could be put into uh, flower beds. The thing to think about is that almost all the spring ephemerals, that's what the, it means that they are there and then they disappear, the leaves disappear. So what I think about when I look at this slide on the right, I love Virginia bluebells, but the Virginia bluebell, all those leaves will be gone. And unless something else is planted there to pop up through that, it will just be barren ground. And so, 
that's what you need to consider if you want to use spring ephemerals to help support pollinators is that they are beautiful, they pop up and then they disappear. Here is, now this slide on the left is a little busy. It's a little hard to tell what's going on, but that, the yellow that you see is, oh, I always, I'm dropping that name. Let me, let me recall it. Golden ground cell is the common name. It's a perennial that will be there year round. But what's interesting about this planting is that the may apples and the uh, Virginia bluebells that you see back here, all of that will disappear and then the ground cell will still be there. And so that's what I mean by keeping that in mind uh, that the foliage, as big as this may apple foliage is, and it's very interesting, the, it, it will be gone in the summertime. So uh, another spring ephemeral, though this, I'm not really sure violets fit in that category called spring ephemerals. I, I probably should figure that out. But violets are very productive. They are the host plant for the fritillary, the greater, the group of fritillary butterflies called greater fritillaries. Uh, the, they have a specialized relationship with violets. So without violets, we have, uh, this is the host plant for the fritillaries, which is the Arkansas state butterfly. I learned that recently. Um, they will, if we did not have the, if we don't have violets, then we don't have fr the greater fritillaries. I think the lesser, the group called lesser fritillary, they, they mostly use violets, but they can use a few others. The greater fritillaries can only use violets. So uh, you'll see here uh, in this slide that I have a number in parentheses. Whenever you see a number in parentheses, that means that that is the number of different butterflies and moths that will use this plant, the violet, as a host plant. So sometimes I'll talk about it, but if I don't mention it, that's what that number in parentheses means. So this is the earliest violet to bloom. There are many different kinds of native violets. My daughter Althea has violets all over her yard and they're so thick in her flower beds that it is like, she uses it like a green mulch. And I think it works great like that. Uh, I would love to have that many violets in my yard acting as a green mulch. And when I say green mulch, what I mean by that is that her violets are so thick that weeds don't pop up through there. So, uh, it takes a bit now bird's foot violet is will never get that thick it's a, the earliest violet to bloom it does not get that thick in fact if it's planted if it were planted in a bed kind of like this one on the left slide it might not thrive at all because it does not do well with too much competition <clears throat> so all of the ones i've showed you so far could work in flower beds um oops i'm stuck again this happened before. Okay, I'm going to leave for a minute. Excuse me, everyone. I'm so, oh, it's not even escaping. This this happened last time too. I don't know if it's my computer or what. So what this means is I have to completely escape and try to. Eric, I'm going to have to try to join again. Um, okay. I don't know why it's getting stuck. So let me see if I can. Control, alt, delete, get out of here. Okay. Looks like your connection might be frozen, Lisa. Not sure if you can hear me, but if you want to try logging in out and logging back in, I can re-add you as a co-host so you can reshare your screen. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. We'll just uh, give Lisa a chance. Looks like she is logging back in. 
So I'm going to add her and let her back in as a co-host. And that way she can reshare her screen here. Sorry, Troy, I accidentally clicked on yours. I made you a co-host, but now I've made Lisa a co-host. Need to let her, give her an opportunity to connect her audio and video. Lisa, I think you might be muted and your video turned off. Okay, I see you now. I think you're muted. If you can unmute your microphone at the might be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, should be a little microphone button. And I'm showing that it's red with the line through it. But if you select that, well, here, let me see if I can un unmute you. All right. Oh. Trying to unmute you. Oh. I keep clicking it and right before I click it, it looks like you're clicking it. I'm muting you back. So let me try one last time. I'm gonna try to unmute you. You might try it again. It's not letting me unmute you. There you go. Okay, you can hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, now <laughs> I need to get my view, speaker view. Oh, oh share that's- Share your screen. Share screen. Okay. Um, let's hope that doesn't happen again. That's very <laughs> distracting. I apologize. I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just a Zoom age that we're in. And that's okay. Yes. Okay. Let me get back to the slide we were talking about. Hmm. It is not moving. This is disconcerting. Let me there. try get the full screen and see if if that will make a difference okay now let me on current slide we've talked about those here we are right. <laughs> sorry sorry guys i hope it doesn't happen again um so moving on along, as far as blooms go, the, uh, let me see, it's going to take, I need to refocus. Service berry is an excellent tree to plant for a year round tree that is beautiful, that is tough, and it will have tons of pollinators on it when it blooms. This is one of the first trees to bloom in the woods in the, in the spring. So it, it, immediately services pollinators. Uh, again, you see there that there are 74 different kinds of butterflies and moths that will use this as a host plant. Uh, just for those of you who aren't very clear, the host plant is the plant that the insect must have to, re to uh, complete its entire life cycle. So there are 74 butterflies and moths that would not be able to complete their life cycle if they did not have, they might be able to use another plant, but many of the insects are so specialized that they can only use one or two plants. So there are 74 different butterflies and moths that use this uh, service berry as a host plant. Uh, the another good early plant and they're blooming right now out i live out in the woods and the service berries are still blooming i think they're finished in fayetteville but boy the red buds are peaking right now so uh the red buds have approximately 22 they are hosts for 22 different butterflies and moths they also all of these plants that i show you particularly the early ones attract bees all the different kinds of native bees and interesting about the red bud is that the blooms, the purple blooms are edible. 
And there are a large variety of bees that use the red butts. Both of these um, would do best in average soil, not super rich. Most native plants don't like super rich plant um, soil, but well-drained soil would be what they would need. They will do fine when they dry out once they're established. Now, one thing about the service berry is that if we have a drought at time and or it just gets hot and dry in July, it will blast a lot of its leaves. So if you want to avoid that and it's in your garden, then give it some extra water. Let's hope it moves. Yay, it moved. <laughs> so another one that is early that they are blooming all over the woods right now is the cherry family. This is a cherry that works well in landscapes because it is about the size of a dogwood you'll notice the star. I think this is the first time that a slide has shown up with a star. This is my, all the plants I'm showing you are uh, highly supportive of pollinators, but there are some that I call superstars. And, or another word that Doug Tallamy uses is keystone plant. I've also heard them called, uh, there's a powerhouse plants, but I'm gonna call them superstars. Uh, this one, I gave it a superstar designation because it's uh, all of the cherries, the prunus, as long as they're native, support around 285 different kinds of butterflies and moths. So that makes it very supportive. It blooms early. It's attractive. It does this one called Mexicana, prunus Mexicana. It is native to our area in spite of that species name, Mexicana. It is native to the Ozark. So it is an excellent plant to use in your landscape um, as long as it had decent drainage and uh, it's just a very productive plant and very attractive. And of course, the, oh, the flowers smell good. So it attracts all kinds of bees and butterflies, moths, many, many different things. This is a plant that uh, the fragrant sumac that is uh, not used very often as a shrub in landscaping. The slide on the left is what it would typically look like in the wild. Well, this one looks like it's been pruned, but it can get that big. Uh, and so it is a large shrub. Uh, it is, the deer don't eat it, which is nice. Well, they might nibble on it, but they are, it's not one of their favorites. The deer generally don't go for leaves that have a strong aroma or smell when you crush them. So uh, it's, it supports 46 different kinds of butterflies and moths. Now this cultivar on the right is called Grow Low and it is native to Great Lakes region. So I wanted to talk, I wanted to divert here a little bit and talk about cultivars. The science, there is lots and lots of research happening about cultivars as we speak. It has been only been being studied for the last 20 or 30 years and, and more and more so nowadays with so many people being interested in ecology and insects and pollinators, et cetera. So it's not real black and white. There are a few things that have been learned but what, and this is one of the things that it, it is becoming clear that if we change the color of the flower or the size of the flower or the shape of the flower too much, then the pollinator insects cannot use that cultivar. This is a great example. This is a purple cone flower on the right. It supports all kinds of bees and butterflies. You will see the, the purple cone flower is one of the classic flowers that you see in pollinator gardens and they're pretty easy to grow. But the rasmataz has been cultivated, that means it has been manipulated by man, excuse me, <clears throat> the definition of cultivar is cultivated by man so that it is no longer, doesn't even look like the native plant. So if you go to a garden center and mostly a lot of cultivars are sold at garden centers. The, um, before you go, look up what the native plant looks like and the more it can look like the native plant, the better. That's a general rule. Uh, when they get 
like this, this razzmatazz supports no, well, it might support a few pollinators, but mostly the pollinators cannot use it. Now I wanted to talk about the leaf color change because so many, the, uh, the one on the left is what the native species looks like, the leaves are green. And the one on the right uh, is cultivated to have burgundy leaves. And this is mostly what you see when you go to a garden center. There are 22 different butterflies and moths that will use the green one as a host. And what we know for certain is that when you change the leaf color of a plant, the insect can no longer use it as a host plant. So pollinators may go to the flower to nectar on it on the burgundy ones, you will still see pollinators on the flowers, but it cannot be used as a host plant. So it does us no good at all to give all the pollinators food if they have nowhere to reproduce. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying you can never use a burgundy plant in your gardens, but just keep that in mind as you try to do what you can to help the pollinators increase the numbers. That is a fact now, it's a proven fact that when we change the color of the leaf, it will not be used as a host plant. So moving on with our individual plants, this is Rose Vervain uh, is an excellent plant. It spreads out a lot like a ground cover. It blooms a long time. Um, it, it, this one needs good drainage. Both of these do. The sand flocks and the rose vein will not grow in heavy, dense, wet soil. <clears throat> so the, uh, what, the, what happens with the rose vervain is it blooms early. Uh, we could see some of this blooming anytime. And, but then it, when summer hits, it gets a little ratty and unattractive. When I worked at the botanical gardens, what we did was cut it back to about six inches. It, the leaves will be brown, the flowers are not very productive in the heat of the summer. So we would cut it back and then it will regrow and rebloom for the fall. Um, the sand flocks again needs good drainage. That common name should help you remember that. Uh, the gritty sand, gritty gravelly kind of soil that drains well would be best for this. Other than that, uh, it pretty much has the same requirements as the one everybody sees blooming right now called Phlox subulata, which is probably, I have seen some uh, insects nectaring on it, but because it's not native to our area, it's native to the Great Lakes region, subulata is, or creeping Phlox is what everybody calls it. That one is not, probably not a host plant in our area. So the ones I am talking about are native to our region. Sand flocks is one of the earlier blooming ones. So it would be a good one to use instead of creeping flocks. Let's see. Um, the red buckeyes are just now beginning to start blooming here in town. I have one right outside my window and so are the dogwoods. <clears throat> the, uh, both of these are great landscaping, medium-sized dogwood-sized trees. Everybody knows what a dogwood is. So I often say it's the size of a dogwood or approximately that size. And that is, we'll, you can see that that would be uh, a good landscaping plant. You can put both of these in full sun, but I think they do best when they get afternoon shade. Uh, both of them get kind of crispy looking when they're in too much sun and they don't get enough water in the summer. The, the dogwood uh, is host to approximately 85 different Lepidoptera. I mean, butter, Lepidoptera is the word that means the order in which all butterflies and moths are in. So uh, lots of insects use the dogwood. One of the ones that I meant to mention when I showed you the picture of the pollinators in the beginning is the Cecropia moth, which uses this as a, uh, as a host plant. Cecropia moth is very interesting looking. It's, almost, it's the biggest moth that we have in our region. It's almost the size of the palm of your hand. So that's just a very interesting moth that this would be a host plant for. 
there are some, and I am hoping I don't forget to tell you about that, that are pollinated for bats, but this, I don't think this is one. Let's move. One of the things to know about red buckeyes is that the, the hummingbirds will show up just about the time the red buckeyes open up. They have a tubular flower. So this will feed the hummingbirds. And whenever you see a humming, uh, the red buckeyes opening, if you want to put out hummingbird feeders, this would be the time to do it. This is another plant that not too many people know about or use as a landscaping plant. It gets big, just like the aromatic cedar does. So this would need uh, either to be in a large flower bed or in a space in your yard where you can mow around it because it gets so big. It would work in a large flower bed. It has the classic pussy willow that people know about. As you see, this one is a superstar in my book because it supports so many different pollinators, butterflies and moths, 215. Uh, it is, most people, when they think of the willows, they think of weeping willow, curly willow. Neither one of those are native to our region, so they are not a host plant. <clears throat> Those need moisture and this is a willow that can handle drier soil. So if you are keen on creating landscaping that you don't have to turn your sprinkler system on, this is still a willow that would work for you. Plus it's a host plant and it has these interesting pussy willow branches. This could be pruned. Uh, again, don't forget that all native plants can be pruned and shaped. So you could cut this one back hard did I look up? I can't remember exactly. I would probably, do, oh, I did look this one up. You do it in the, when it's like in January or February, but it, because this one, I think it blooms on new wood. Let me check myself on that one before I give you incorrect information. Well, I don't have that written down, but um, I suppose I should look that one up. Maybe Eric could look it up for me. Does it, does, do the pussy willows bloom on old or new wood? When would you prune it hard if you wanted to prune it? I'm gonna keep moving since I don't have an answer to that one. I asked myself a question. And I'll I look it up on Google and see if I can find out. Yeah, thank you. While I'm continuing this process. Uh, wild columbine is just a great perennial. Now I've switched to a few perennials that come back every year. It does move around, it'll reseed, but it is, not, it is very manageable. You could certainly pull this one up uh, and it's, it's easy to weed it out if it gets too dense for you, if it reseeds in places that you don't want. But it needs good drainage. Uh, it doesn't grow in wet, heavy soil, uh, but it is a great flower bed perennial that comes back every year. It also feeds the hummingbirds which is one of our pollinators. And it's just a beautiful showy plant. The Phlox de Vericata is uh, the second kind of Phlox I have shown you. It blooms later than the sand Phlox. It's blooming right now at my house. It is um, a very tough plant, very reliable. It seems to come back every year and just get a little bit bigger all the time. Uh, this one will bloom in a little bit more shade. It can take the, the wild columbine, both of these can take part, what I call part sun, which means that would mean uh, it would need to get a, a little, uh, enough sun to make it bloom, but it can have, both of these can handle some shade. Oh, it's stuck again. This is very frustrating. I'm gonna back out, stuck. Well, I don't know what to think about this. Hmm. Tried every arrow button. Let me see if I can, uh, it won't even let me escape so that I can manually handle things. I'm gonna have to, I know my daughter Althea is watching. Thea, can you text me any tips that might make a difference on this? Why I keep getting stuck? Do you have any? It's even won't it won't let me escape so that I can. Um, 
get out of it. Is it possible you might have hit like alt tab or something that would have brought I'm it trying to not to touch program. anything. No, she doesn't have any help. I'm trying not to touch anything other than my arrow, okay. which uh, I'm going to have to try to. I have an option here to request remote control if you would yes. like for me to do that and see if Let I can help you. Yeah, uh, that's what Rosalind did when it was happening okay. before. I'm going to let you help me here because it takes too long to totally shut down and come back. Thank you, Eric. So right. should I just tell you when to change and I will quit? Um, let you me wanna... stop the remote control and see if you're able to go back to having. Um, uh, okay. Stop what? sharing screen there. Let me get. Okay, I should go to share screen. screen. Should I do share screen? Yes. Uh, and see if it lets you advance. Share screen. Okay. And I'm also trying to manage the chat uh, and questions yeah. and all that. So okay. So let me, let, I'm back. We're, let's hope I'm back on track. Well, we're going to talk about Penstem in a minute before we see if we have any more problems. So Penstem is another tubular flower. Uh, tough comes back every year. It likes reasonable drainage, which means avoid the heavy wet soil. Um, it likes sunshine. Um, one thing I would do about penstemon, uh, they're very attractive, but after they bloom, they're not very attractive. So I would cut them back to the basal leaves after they bloom. Uh, and then they're, it just stays attractive in your flower bed. I wanted to, let me check. It always distracts me. Sorry guys about this, this problem. I wanna make sure I'm not forgetting. And I'm also looking for the ones that are pollinated by bats. I just find that interesting that um, not yet, we'll get there. Uh, let me turn my phone back off. Okay, so about Monarda, there are a couple of kinds that get recommended or that are, you will find on the native plant list. Uh, I recommend this one for flower beds the most. And you can see on the, in the Monarda, the bee balm slide that pretty uh, red columbine in the background. Uh, but the bee balm, there are two, a couple of choices. There's one called Monarda fistulosa. The common name is wild bee balm. It is much wilder. And so I would save it for the wilder places. Not put, if you put it up in your flower beds, it will take over. This one is a little aggressive, but I consider it manageable as long as you get out in your flower beds once or twice a year. So this is the one I like to recommend the most for people's flower beds. It's not very tall. It blooms and blooms. It's got a very long bloom. Uh, it's fragrant and it's uh, the better one to use. Like I said, many bees will go for it. The common name bee balm, but also butterflies and other pollinators. I'm stuck. Mm. It's, uh, Eric, you're going to have to move me again. Let's see if I can escape. No. Nope. Oh, here, let me do the remote control thing. Okay. And then. I, I, I need to hit approve. I think so, yes. Sorry for the glitches, guys. This is technology for us. Don't know All what's right. causing this. Okay, so uh, Robin's plantain is one that is uh, pollinated by bats. We don't see it, I don't think, but it is a possibility. And so if you had a camera, you might be able to catch that. This one is a smaller, tidier. Uh, it's in a group of flowers that people call flea bane. That's the common name. Uh, I remember that flea bane name because fleas hop around and so do these flowers. They reseed here, there, and everywhere. This one isn't too bad. I think it's manageable. And also another thing about this one is a, it can be growing up under a shrub that doesn't leaf out until later. This slide was taken at the botanical gardens where it is growing under uh, the yellow Baptisia, which gets huge, and you don't even see the plantain. The Baptisia takes over, and it yet it comes, it does not kill it out. It comes back every year. Uh, the New Jersey tea is a great shrub to use because there are not a whole lot of shrubs that are approximately this size that are natives. 
It is uh, has a very deep tap root. You need to, once you put it there, you need to try to leave it wherever you have it. Uh, it, it will take a few years to get this nice, this big and thick, but it is prunable and shapeable and it is a great plant to put in your flower beds. Uh, it is a smaller shrub, it grows pretty slow and it will support many of the different butterflies and bees. I'm gonna try to see if it'll move. Good, it did. I'm, I'm gun shy here about whether or not it's going to work. Uh, Golden Alexander is a host plant for the uh, swallowtail. Let me make sure I'm saying that right. It, it, yes, for the black swallowtail. So it, it also will attract other uh, bees and butterflies, but it's really a showy plant. It gets, um, I put the heights and sizes there so you can see that. I hope that helps you visualize how big these plants are by looking at the size that I have listed there. But it's an excellent plant to put in your flower beds. Again, this is one that I would, let me use my arrow. After it blooms, I would cut it in, almost in half or a little bit more and then it'll just stay attractive. The foliage is nice, it has good color in the fall. It's just a nice plant and it has uh, four or five weeks of these yellow blooms about the time that the black swallowtail needs to use it as host plant. Now, Coreopsis, this Coreopsis is a great plant. It blooms a long time. It uh, has an extremely long bloom and it attracts a large number of beneficial insects, bees and butterflies, but it is not well behaved. So I would not put this in my, use this in flower beds. It will tend to take over. If you have a large yard or more of a meadow type yard or a huge flower bed, you might plant some of this, but otherwise it, it's such an excellent pollinator. I wanted to mention it, but keep in mind that it is not well behaved. It will take over. These are two of my favorite perennial native plants. The Indian pink is just so showy. It also will work in the shade it will still bloom in the shade, which is amazing. Uh, I don't think it would love it if it got all day sunshine, but so anything that blooms in the shade probably needs at least some afternoon shade. This is another one that after it blooms, the first flush of bloom, if you will quickly prune it in half, it will bloom again in the fall. So there are not many of the native perennials that do that, but I've just mentioned two. So that's, that's great to keep in mind that, that you can get a second bloom if you'll just go to the trouble to cut it and it keeps it more attractive to cut it off. The blue Babtesia is a very striking and showy plant. Uh, they have an interesting seed pod that pops up that comes, it's black, but even the black seed pod is interesting. You can also cut them off and they make a rattle, which is a fun toy for children. Uh, the, one of the interesting facts about the blue Baptisia is that new queen bees will go to this plant. Now, a new queen bee, bee is special. That means she's trying to establish a new hive. Uh, a bumblebee is what I'm talking about. And uh, she needs a certain kind of and dense nutrition in order to get healthy and pull off a new hive. And that is one of the services that this blue indigo will provide is for the new queen bumblebees. So it's striking, it's beautiful, it's tough, comes back every year and it supports our native bumblebees. By the way, let's, I wanna mention all these bees. They, most bees are not aggressive. Only I've heard 1%, 2% of insects are considered pest. Even bumblebees, they are not pests. You practically have to sit on a bumblebee to get it to sting you or step on it or catch it in the crook of your arm. But they are, uh, when I worked at the botanical gardens for eight years, we were all up in these flowers around these bumblebees. All they care about is nectar and pollen. They really did not care about us. Not in once in my eight years there did I know of anyone, now probably somebody did, but not on our team did anyone get stung. They are so busy doing their jobs that they really don't, they are not aggressive. There are some aggressive 
insects. You probably know them, the red wasp, et cetera. Uh, they're very common. Most of us know the ones, and those are the ones we buy the insecticide and try to get them to hibernate or go somewhere else, but not bumblebees. So keep that in mind if you're thinking, I don't want to bring bumblebees into my yard. So now we've moved into summer season, and I'm, I don't have many slides to show you about summer because, again, there are so many things blooming in May, June, and July that uh, I, want you to, I want to talk more about the ones that bloom in the spring and the fall. I do want to mention that the uh, butterfly weed, which is in the milkweed group, it has, is a superstar. And the main reason you all know this, I think, or you would be at this in this uh, class is because it all the milkweeds support the monarch, which is one of our pollinators that is in trouble. We have such low percentages of monarchs that many of us are trying to add milkweed to our gardens. Uh, this is also one that after it blooms, you can leave it and let it go to seed. I did that last year at my home because I wanted the seeds to scatter about. But if you can also prune this one off and it will come back with new tender foliage and sometimes it will rebloom in the fall. So it depends on your purpose. If, you, if you've got plenty of it established, then you don't necessarily need to have so many of the seeds scattering about. So uh, when I get enough butterfly weed going, I probably will start to prune mine to get that tender foliage because when the monarchs come through in the fall, they prefer tender foliage. It, this will be kind of woody and the leaves will be hard, uh, tough by fall and the monarchs will not use it. They will find something more tender if they can. So it's not that they abandon it, but if they have a more tender choice, they will go for the tender choice. That's why it's good to prune it after it blooms and have it come back with tender foliage. Now the button bush is one that you typically see growing. It grows all along the edges at Beaver Lake and it has a pretty wild look, but it can be pruned and shaped. And you, this is in the butterfly garden, this slide is in the butterfly garden at the botanical gardens. They do get very big, so keep that in mind, but this is the one that I looked up that you can prune it hard in January, February, if it gets out of control, if it gets too big, because it will bloom on new wood. Let me, let me double check this, but I'm pretty sure that, that this is the one that I looked up, that it blooms on new wood and that you can prune this one hard if it gets out of control. So it just will be covered with these interesting little ball shaped spher spherical flowers and covered in pollinators. It will just literally be buzzing. You will hear the noise when you get near this, when it's in bloom. Then the, bloom, the balls, sometimes they go through a week or so where they turn red and then they come back again uh, and then they turn brown. And I think it's interesting to see those blooms even in the winter. I just shaped mine before it leafed out. I didn't prune it hard, but I just edited it a little bit and to keep it shapely. If it does outgrow its spot, then I will prune it hard, like I said, um, because it blooms on new wood. Did I skip one? Yes, I, I did. Okay, I, I hit two that time. Looks like it's working. So Rudbeckia is a classic uh, pollinator flower that a lot of people put in pollinator gardens. I think this one can be quite aggressive. It, um, the one, particularly the one called Goldsturm, which is sold a lot in the garden centers. If you get the native one that is called Rudbeckia fulgida and the variety of fulgida, which is the native species of Rudbeckia, and you probably will only find this sold in some of the native plant sales that are happening. It is not aggressive like the one called Goldstrom. Uh, go, every year I take my shovel and just dig a lot out of the Goldstrom that I have and give it away or compost it because it, it spreads quite a bit, but it is such a good plant and so reliable. And 
you know, Black Eyed Susans, everybody loves those. They are, they are wonderful. It is hosed for about 15 different pollen. It has long bloom. That's another reason to use it. Particularly the native one has, it has longer bloom than the one called Goldstrom. The one called Goldstrom actually blooms in June and the wild native species that is Rebecca fulgida does bloom in July and August. And maybe into September, it has very long bloom. The one, the, the, the right slide called Culver's Root, this is a really tough plant. It will grow in some, and bloom in some shade. The thing to remember about this one and all native plants is, is if you put these plants in richer soil, they will grow much taller. This one is in the botanical gardens and you can see it's probably five feet tall but I've also planted it in very poor soil and it only grows to be about two and a half feet tall. That applies to most native plants. The richer the soil, the taller it will get. So don't over improve your soil if you are hoping to have more native plants. That's really not necessary. Um, I think, let's see, the thing I wanted to remember about Culver's root, oh yeah, it has a, High number of bees need this plant and use it, especially the smaller native bees. So this is both, every plant I'm showing you is an excellent pollinator plant. The two lobelias, I love them both. I like having them both. Uh, one, both of them tend to grow along creek beds and in moister places, which means you could put this one up in a richer flower bed. Uh, again, it will grow tall if it is in too rich, so it doesn't need to have fertilizers added, but a looser, richer soil will grow both of these. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the lo red lobelia is that it will attract hummingbirds. Hummingbirds tend to go for red and bees tend to go for blue. And so you will see hummingbirds at the red lobelia and you will see lots of bees at the blue lobelia. Both of them will reseed, but not so much that you can't control it. And I'm hoping I'll, they reseed more and more at um, my flower beds. Let me make sure. The the helianthus is uh, the woodland sunflowers. All of the sunflowers get are, are uh, superstars. And that is because as far as the perennials go, the three plants that support the most uh, butterflies and moths are sunflowers, um, goldenrod, and I can't remember the third one. Maybe it'll, it'll come to me. Uh, Maybe it's in one of my next slides, but the, they have, and that's because they have such high numbers of, they support more butterflies and moths than most perennials do. This is, you know, trees and shrubs su support more than the perennials do. But as far as the perennials do, the echinacea, I mean, the um, um, goldenrod and the sunflowers support more than most others. So that's, this one also will bloom in the shade and in the woods where I live, it is blooming around the base of many of my trees. It does recede, but again, I think it's very manageable. Um, let's see, it's, yes, it, it can handle the filtered shade or birds will eat the seed heads in the winter time on this woodland sunflower. Uh, so it is just a, a a very tough and good thing to have in your flower beds or in your yards. The Slender Mountain Mint is one of those that if you get close to it when it's blooming, you will hear the buzz. There are so many different pollinators that will come to this plant. Uh, there are a couple of kinds of, of mountain mints. There are, keep in mind that the mints can be aggressive like all mints. I think of this one as the lesser aggressive of all the mountain mints. And muticum is too, the one called clustered mountain mint. You will have to sort of shrink this one, uh, but I do think it's manageable and it is an excellent one to use in your flower beds. Now we're moving into autumn. And the thing to think about is that in 
when you drive around in August, September, August is when we all get sick of the heat. We are tired of watering our flower beds and schlepping around the hose. So a lot of us decide that fall is right around the corner and we're not going to water anything else. If you drive around town and look for flowers in August, September, October, November, you will see many less flowers blooming. So again, this is the time to focus. Unfortunately, even in the world of natives, there are not nearly as many flowers that will naturally happen on their own. And so the selection is much slimmer in the fall, but the, uh, this, um, I already mentioned that goldenrod was a superstar because it, it is uh, host for 85 different butterflies and moths. Now there are many different kinds of goldenrods and some are well behaved, not many, only about four are well behaved. And that is on a list that I've created. You'll see it on the last slide where you can go find this list called Well Behaved Natives. Both of these are on the list. I, the cliff goldenrod looks like a shrub. It's very tidy, very easy to use. Um, it's not very tall. There are many goldenrods that are extremely tall. So you wanna study your goldenrods and pick the ones that are well behaved if you're using these in your yard. The reason I like the one called uh, Solidega speciosa is because it has a long bloom it blooms so late, it is one of the last ones to bloom and because it has such a showy bloom. So I really like that one in terms of, you can see the difference in the blooms of these two goldenrods. So uh, I would suggest that if you wanna, every yard should have goldenrod in it and, and asters because they, uh, it is so hard and difficult for the pollinators to find plants to nectar on and get pollen in the fall. So it's essential that we focus more on the fall planting. So this is two suggestions. These are two more plants that bloom in the fall. Most people aren't familiar with Boltonia. Um, it can get big and out of, con uh, not out of control, but it can get, uh, I don't, I think it's fairly easy to control accurately uh, as long as you are the type of person it will go in your garden once or twice a year. One thing to remember about the fall plants is that anything that blooms in August, September, October, November, you can give it what I call a spring haircut. And that means that in <clears throat> uh, May, about the time the kids used to get out of school, I'm not sure what's going to happen. You know, everything's changing with COVID, but about the time, the end of May, sometime in the month of May, you can give all the, any plant that blooms in the August, September, October in the fall season, cut it in half. Whatever the foliage is, cut it in half or a little bit more and it will still bloom. It will not be as big, as rangy. It will be much denser at the botanical gardens when I work there, at this aster on the right. One year we, the aster in the spring, it was obvious that it had some kind of fungus on the leaves that was making the plant decline drastically. So we decided to, first we established what the disease was, it was a fungus, and we decided to cut it literally to the ground. The stems were one inch tall when we finished butchering it. And we cleaned up all the leaves because of the fungus and took them somewhere away. And that plant came back and it was only about a foot and a half when it bloomed. It was exquisite. It looked like mums, purple mums, and it was just 100% solid blooms. So keep that in mind if you have some of the fall blooms, blooming perennials that get too big for you. You can butcher them and in the, at the end of spring and they will still bloom. These are two more, this is a white aster. I just wanted to give you more options for blooms in the fall. Sneeze weed is another one that blooms in the fall and it will bloom till frost. It will be covered with bees, many different kinds of bees. I don't know why it's called sneeze sneezeweed because I don't think it makes people sneeze. I don't like that common name, but that is the common name. So we have to stick with that. Uh, lots and lots of bees will be on this one. Uh, I also wanted to show you because I live where I have lots of shade and I'm always looking for things that will bloom in shade. And I think all gardens should have more aster 
and more goldenrod. And these are two that can handle not dense shade, but they can handle high filtered shade or lots of shade. So this is an option for those of you who have more shade. I also have a list, a document that I created called Native Plants for Shade. And at the end, I will show you where you can access that. Uh, be, and I, I create these lists for myself. That's the way it started out. And now I share them with people because I live in the woods and I wanted more flowers to bloom in the woods. So I created this document. It's about eight pages long. It's quite a few plants and it's, set, it's divided into uh, trees, shrubs, perennials, et cetera, but it's all native plants. So you will have access to that if you want that document. Both of these I have planted in the shade and I just need to wait a few years. One thing a little ditty to know about native plants, especially if you buy these smaller plants that are at uh, even a, you know, a quart, the first year a perennial will sleep, the second year it will creep and the third year it will leap. So sometimes it takes three years for some of these perennials to really take off. Don't get discouraged is what I want to say. Now we are back to the winter and this is another witch hazel. This is the one that tends to bloom before Christmas. It starts blooming before Christmas. I have also seen it blooming after Christmas. What I love about this slide is how well shaped this tree is. This is not what it would look like in the wild, but because this one has been pruned and shaped, it is exquisite as far as a plant goes in your, to be used in your more manicured landscapes. And so that's what I have shown you different ways that you can have plants year round that will support the pollinators. Now, um, this is some of the resources. Now, I, I actually made this slide before the Ozarks chapter of Wild Ones got their website up and running. And all of this information in the top here, all of this, can be found here. So if you go and click on that, uh, I wanna say thank you one more time to Shot Scott Beely for getting this up and running and managing the website for us. He has done an excellent job. It's so easy to use. If you, you uh, it's easy to move around in and find all the resources. What I like about this is so many resources that support landscaping with native plants are in one spot. And of course you can still go down the rabbit hole uh, just like we all can on the web when you're researching things. But that is where you can find the list that I mentioned called Native Plants for Shade and Well-Behaved Natives. They're both obvious and you can click on those and they are in a PDF if you wanna print them out. Um, this is an excellent list. I don't think this is on our website. That's one reason I left this box up because that is another excellent list of, um, it was put out by the Arkansas, uh, the Monarch Society Organization of Arkansas. And it, it's called Arkansas Native Plant List for Supporting Monarchs and Pollinators. That is a great list. I also created a list for this uh, slideshow and Eric and I probably need to talk about how, I, we talked about it yesterday, maybe, maybe sending that out if you're interested in a follow-up email. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't sent it to Eric yet, but I can. And then all of you guys could have access to the list that is, uh, covers every single slide that I showed today on this presentation with the needs for sun, the height, the moisture need, and a few notes about each of these plants. So Eric, um, this is question and answer time. And is it gonna be possible for us to get that, uh, the document that goes with this PowerPoint to the participants today? Yeah, I think it should definitely be possible. Here, let me share my video here. Um, I'm going to stop um, controlling your screen. Get a little remote control. Should I hit stop share or just? You can keep it on that if you want to. Okay. Other, or you can, yeah, if you want to, yeah, it's up to you. Um, Let's you might leave, leave it, it up just so, so people have that to look at here. Yeah. 
but yeah, thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful presentation. We really appreciate that. It was a lot of great information. Uh, we definitely appreciate you sharing your expertise and wealth of experience with us. I uh, do have a list of questions I've been compiling during the presentation. Um, and uh, so if, if anyone has a question now and you want to ask Lisa, go ahead and type it into the chat box. Uh, Cheryl asked, uh, when should you cut back the rose vervain? Uh, it blooms in the spring and it gets ugly when it starts getting hot. And when it's ugly, cut it back. Okay. Uh, Sally uh, was wondering, she's in Virginia zone six and was wondering what gardening zone uh, Arkansas is in. Arkansas is six too. If you are in Virginia, you will have your own set of native plants to your region. Um, I, I, I think the best way to check, I, this is something we've encountered with Zoom because people from all over the country can be listening, is to type in the genus name of your plant, let's say Asclepius, that stands for you know the milkweeds, and then the word BONAP, B-O-N-A-P, that stands for Biota of North American Project, Did I, I think, it's close to that. But that will send up a map that shows you, and then if you, you can see every species in the country and you can tell whether or not it's native to your region. All right. uh, Jessica was wondering, she said uh, she has a buckeye that is huge, about 10 feet. Uh, <laughs> does it help to cut those back? Well, all native plants can be pruned and shaped. And so the time to prune a buckeye because it blooms in the spring would be after it blooms. So if you want to get that one, unfortunately, this is so typical of so many plants, people plant things close to their house and then they outgrow the space. But you could prune it after it finishes blooming. Uh, Jesse asked, uh, was it the buckeye or the dogwood that hosts uh, uh, Secropia moth? The dogwood. dogwood. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Mary asked if there was a website or place where we can find the list of butterflies and moths that are listed for the plants. Uh, I gave her a couple of resources. I directed her to our website, which has a link to a list of host plants, uh, on Prairie Moon site, and also a recommended native plants for pollinators, uh, the book by Heather Holm. But um, I didn't know if you had any other resources that you would like to direct her. Uh, I to. don't have it quick where I can find it, but I would, there is the, um, the there is a, a, an organization that focuses on butterflies in Arkansas. So that one would have, if you find that website, I'm going to guess they're going to tell you specifically that relationship between each butterfly and each host plant. Yeah. I believe Lori Spencer has a yeah. book guide on Arkansas butterflies and moths. And uh, there's some great information in that book also on butterfly gardening that lists various plants, uh, pollinator plants and host plants for butterfly and moth populations in Arkansas. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, let's see, Danny, or uh, yeah, Danny is wondering, let's see, uh, he knows that some, at least some sunflowers are aleopathic. Uh, has anyone noticed that with any of the sunflower species? Um, I'm okay, botanist. The ones you discussed. Uh, scientist Eric, what does aleopathic mean? Define, uh, remind me. I believe that's where they're putting out things in their roots and otherwise to discourage uh, other plants from oh. growing. Uh, oh, okay. Kitchen. And he's saying, what's the question again? About sunflower species. I, I don't know that that's the. Um, the case, I'm, you know, a little pathy. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up. I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, Bernetta was also wondering if Eridinon uh, species or Erigeron, which I believe is that the daisy flea beans. Yeah, that um, that's the flea beans. They were also a little pathic. You know, I really don't know about that. That can't answer those questions. Sorry about that. It's all right. Yeah, I know cedars. You know, supposedly are you know have that. Uh, and I think tall fescue does too. And that's one of the reasons why tall fescue is able to outcompete a lot of native species and just kind of take over areas. Yeah. Well, you know, on the flea bane, um, I, I mentioned the way it, it was growing is uh, up under a yellow baptisia, 
a giant yellow Baptisia. So big, it gets so big you don't even see. So those two roots seem to be uh, coexisting. Mm -hmm. I know like I keep our place pretty wild and I had native species and control the invasives and I leave all the flea bane and it seems to do, I do too. Like the other species that I have out there. So I do too. I at but. the botanical gardens, we just let the flea bang go wherever it wanted because it, the one that, uh, it all, some of them die down in the summer. There, there's one that cut that grows in the summer. Mm -hmm. There's so many. There are a few different ones, and so I don't think of it as a problem plant. Uh, Amanda asked, among the native mints, is there one or two kinds that are best for pollinators compared to the others, and is that why you chose mountain mint? Uh. Well, the mountain, the ones called mountain mints are the um, pycnanthemum. Uh, that is the genus name. There are different species of mountain mints, and they are all, all of the native mountain mint pycnanthemums are uh, very attractive and supportive of many different kinds of butterflies and bees. And I choose plants according to what works for landscaping. That's my specialty in terms of well-behaved natives. So I know the muticum, the one that's called clustered mountain mint is the most well-behaved, but in rich soil, it will still take off and take over. Uh, I grow slender mountain mint in terrible, terrible soil, and it is very manageable. But I'm talking about really bad Arkansas shallow rocky soil. And so it doesn't take, almost nothing takes over in rocky soil. <laughs> I think the uh, Monardas are another genus of mint that also supports a lot of different pollinator populations as well. Right. Um, it's in the mint family, you mean, not a right. genus. The mint, yes. Well, the because, Monarda is the genus. Yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah the Monardas are in the mint family. Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And so many of the mint families will spread rapidly. So you just either need to put them in poor soil or um, be, be willing to manage them. I would not, I would, that's why I mentioned the ones that I did because I like people using them in spite of the fact that you have to go out there. There is no such thing as maintenance free. <laughs> there just isn't. All right, let's see. Jessica had another question. Is the false aster what she is seeing right now along roadsides, yards, et cetera? Hmm, no, Boltonia blooms in the late summer. So you, it would be something else you were seeing. I'm not sure what's blooming that looks like Boltonia right now. A lot uh, of the asters are, yeah, summer and late summer bloomers. Yes, opinion. all the asters, including the false aster, is a late summer bloomer. Uh, Which see, means it can have a spring haircut if you want. I like that spring haircut. <laughs> well, actually, I got that from Scott. Um, I, I should have given him credit. That's what he calls it. Scott At, Beasley? No, the oh. one that runs. Um, oh, I, I, I can't. I'm blank right now. <laughs> I can't think of maybe that. Maybe I'll give him credit before we stop. Um, go ahead. Next Anubis, question. Uh, also says that winter ryegrass is allelopathic towards small seeds of many vegetables and wild plants. Um, yeah, I know a lot of our native ryes are cool season grasses as well. I'm assuming you're meaning our native uh, winter ryes. Um, and because there's also some non natives that are you know, often planted for erosion control. Uh, Anne asked, any advice for planting butterfly weed seeds? Uh, do they need to go through cold or other special treatment? Yes, they need to be stratified. And so um, uh, if you go to the Wild Ones website, is it Prairie Moon? Is that the one that has all the, um, there is information on starting seeds and it's just a click and it links you there. So I would advise you if you wanna start play with starting butterfly weed to read up on it first. I'm pretty lazy about stratification. I don't really like doing it, putting these bags of sandy seeds in my refrigerator. So I throw seeds out in the fall. You get much worse germination when you do that. Uh, 
but that is an option to let nature do the stratification where you put the seeds out. I do it around Christmas or before Christmas, somewhere around Christmas. And that gives, most seeds don't need more than about three months of stratification. But there's still other techniques sometimes, uh, you probably ought to read up on it before you, if you want to, if you want to grow butterfly weed from seed. Yeah, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, you know, when you put out seed in the fall, if you, you know, you know, cover it with straw or something, otherwise it'll just be a bird buffet too. Yeah, that's... And if you are going to stratify in your fridge or something like that, make it, make sure you're periodically aerating out the back or otherwise you'll often get mold growing in there, which will uh, ruin all the seeds. So. That website that is on the Wild Ones website is excellent for propagating wildflower seeds. There is a, the link we have to how to grow a prairie from seed. On no, the it's, um, that's not the link. It's, okay. it's, it's just prairie moons, I think about, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to, I might have it in some of my documents. Let me, let me find it. We could also send out any links or resources in a follow-up yeah. email and I send a link to the recording out to all the, the, the folks. Okay. Uh, when you send the, the handout, we could have that link for propagation. I'll sure. look that up and, and make sure when we're done, which one it is. All right, let's see. Um, Danny says his method of stratification uh, for things that don't have enough to do, uh, for things that don't have enough to do outside, let the seeds sit overnight in warm water, not hot. Put the seeds in moistened paper towel not wet and wring it out, put in a Ziploc bag and stick in the fridge with the date on the bag for when they come out. Works well for him. Uh, he's never had anything mold. Yeah, a lot of people use that paper and towel method. That is one method. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, that looks to be all the questions that we have. Uh, again, Lisa, thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And I wanna thank everyone for being with us here today. Uh, again, this uh, webinar has been recorded. Uh, we do intend to upload it to our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and uh, type in Wild Ones Ozark Chapter, you'll be able to view uh, this recording along with all of the other ones that we've had uh, going back to last year. I want to give a, one last plug for our next webinar, uh, which will be Wednesday, May 5th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. That will be Riparian Management for Landowners with Nate Weston of the Beaver Watershed Alliance. If you'd like to join uh, the Wild Ones Ozark chapter, go to wildones.org slash membership. Uh, you can also go to our new chapter website, which is now live. That's ozark.wildones.org. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash ozarkwildones, or you can contact us via email at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lissa. This has been a wonderful presentation. And everyone, I hope you all have a good day.